The Prince and the Pauper, A Tale for Young People of All Ages, by Mark Twain. To those good-mannered and agreeable children, Susie and Clara Clemens, this book is affectionately inscribed by their father. The quality of mercy is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. Merchant of Venice Preface I will set down a tale as it was told to me by one who had it of his father, which latter had it of his father, this last having in like manner had it of his father, and so on, back and still back, three hundred years and more, the fathers transmitting it to the sons and so preserving it. It may be history, it may be only a legend, a tradition. It may have happened, it may not have happened, but it could have happened. It may be that the wise and the learned believed it in the old days. It may be that only the unlearned and the simple loved it and credited it. Hugh Latimer, Bishop of Worcester, to Lord Cromwell, on the birth of the Prince of Wales, afterward Edward VI, from the national manuscripts preserved by the British government. Right Honorable, Salutem in Christo Jesu, and Sire, here is no less joying and rejoicing in these parties for the birth of our Prince, whom we hungered for so long, than there was, I trow, intervincinos at the birth of S.I. Baptist, as this bearer, Master Aarons, can tell you. God give us all grace to yield due thanks to our Lord God, God of England, for verily he hath showed himself God of England, or rather an English God, if we consider and ponder well all his proceedings with us from time to time. He hath overcome all our illness with his exceeding goodness, so that we are now more than compelled to serve him, seek his glory, promote his word, if the devil of all devils be not in us. We have now the stoop of vain trusts and the stay of vain expectations. Let us all pray for his preservation, and I for my part will wish his grace always have, and even now from the beginning, governors, instructors, and officers of right judgment, ni optimum ingenium, non optima educatione depravetur. But what a great fool am I! So what devotion showeth many times but little discretion! And thus the God of England will ever be with you in all your proceedings. The 19th of October, Yours, H.L.B. of Worcester, now at Hartlebury. If ye would excite this bearer to be more hearty, again the abuse of imagery, or more forward to promote the verity, it might do good. Not that it came of me, but of yourself, etc. Addressed to the Right Honorable Lord P. Seal, his singular good lord. Chapter 1. The Birth of the Prince and the Pauper In the ancient city of London, on a certain autumn day in the second quarter of the sixteenth century, a boy was born to a poor family of the name of Canty, who did not want him. On the same day, another English child was born to a rich family of the name of Tudor, who did want him. All England wanted him too. England had so longed for him and hoped for him and prayed God for him that now he was really come, the people went nearly mad for joy. Mere acquaintances hugged and kissed each other and cried. 
Everybody took a holiday, and high and low, rich and poor, feasted and danced and sang, and got very mellow. And they kept this up for days and nights together. By day, London was a sight to see, with gay banners waving from every balcony and housetop, and splendid pageants marching along. By night it was again a sight to see, with its great bonfires at every corner, and its troops of revelers making merry around them. There was no talk in all of England but of the new baby, Edward Tudor, Prince of Wales, who lay lapped in silks and satins, unconscious of all this fuss, and not knowing that great lords and ladies were tending him and watching over him, and not caring either. But there was no talk about the other baby, Tom Canty, lapped in his poor rags, except among the family of paupers whom he had just come to trouble with his presence. Chapter 2 Tom's Early Life Let us skip a number of years. London was fifteen hundred years old and was a great town for that day. It had a hundred thousand inhabitants, some think double as many. The streets were very narrow and crooked and dirty, especially in that part where Tom Canty lived, which was not far from London Bridge. The houses were of wood, with the second story projecting over the first, and the third sticking its elbows out beyond the second. The higher the houses grew, the broader they grew. They were skeletons of strong crisscross beams, with solid material between coated with plaster. The beams were painted red or blue or black, according to the owner's taste, and this gave the houses a very picturesque look. The windows were small, glazed with little diamond-shaped panes, and they opened outward on hinges like doors. The house which Tom's father lived in was up a foul little pocket called Awful Court, out of Pudding Lane. It was small, decayed, and rickety, but it was packed full of wretchedly poor families. Canty's tribe occupied a room on the third floor. The mother and father had a sort of bedstead in the corner, but Tom, his grandmother, and his two sisters, Bet and Nan, were not restricted. They had all the floor to themselves and might sleep where they chose. There were the remnants of a blanket or two, and some bundles of ancient and dirty straw, but these could not rightly be called beds, for they were not organized. They were kicked into a general pile, mornings, and selections made from the mass at night for service. Bet and Nan were fifteen years old, twins. They were good-hearted girls, unclean, clothed in rags, and profoundly ignorant. Their mother was like them, but the father and the grandmother were a couple of fiends. They got drunk whenever they could. Then they fought each other or anybody else who came in the way. They cursed and swore always, drunk or sober. John Canty was a thief, and his mother a beggar. They made beggars of the children, but failed to make thieves of them. Among, but not of, the dreadful rabble that inhabited the house was a good old priest whom the king had turned out of house and home with a pension of a few farthings. And he used to get the children aside and teach them right ways secretly. Father Andrew also taught Tom a little Latin and how to read and write, and would have done the same with the girls, but they were afraid of the jeers of their friends, who could not have endured such a queer accomplishment in them. All awful court was just such another hive as Canty's house. Drunkenness, riot, and brawling were the order there every night and nearly all night long. Broken heads were as common as hunger in that place. Yet little Tom was not unhappy. He had a hard time of it, but did not know it. It was the sort of time that all the awful court boys had. 
Therefore, he supposed it was the correct and comfortable thing. When he came home empty-handed at night, he knew his father would curse him and thrash him first, and that when he was done, the awful grandmother would do it all over again and improve on it, and that away in the night his starving mother would slip to him stealthily with any miserable scrap or crust she had been able to save for him by going hungry herself, notwithstanding she was often caught in that sort of treason and soundly beaten for it by her husband. No, Tom's life went along well enough, especially in summer. He only begged just enough to save himself, for the laws against mendicancy were stringent and the penalties heavy. So he put in a good deal of his time listening to good Father Andrew's charming old tales and legends about giants and fairies, dwarves and genii, and enchanted castles and gorgeous kings and princes. His head grew to be full of these wonderful things, and many a night as he lay in the dark on his scant and offensive straw, tired, hungry, and smarting from a thrashing, he unleashed his imagination and soon forgot his aches and pains in delicious picturings to himself of the charmed life of a petted prince in a regal palace. One desire came in time to haunt him day and night. It was to see a real prince with his own eyes. He spoke of it once to some of his awful court comrades, but they jeered him and scoffed him so unmercifully that he was glad to keep his dream to himself after that. He often read the priest's old books and got him to explain and enlarge upon them. His dreamings and readings worked certain changes in him by and by. His dream people were so fine that he grew to lament his shabby clothing and his dirt and to wish to be clean and better clad. He went on playing in the mud just the same and enjoying it too, but instead of splashing around in the Thames solely for the fun of it, he began to find an added value in it because of the washings and cleansings it afforded. Tom could always find something going on around the Maypole in Cheapside and at the fairs, and now and then he and the rest of London had a chance to see a military parade when some famous unfortunate was carried prisoner to the tower by land or boat. One summer's day he saw poor Anne Askew and three men burned at the stake in Smithfield and heard an ex-bishop preach a sermon to them which did not interest him. Yes, Tom's life was varied and pleasant enough on the whole. By and by Tom's reading and dreaming about princely life wrought such a strong effect upon him that he began to act the prince unconsciously. His speech and manners became curiously ceremonious and courtly to the vast admiration and amusement of his intimates. But Tom's influence among these young people began to grow now day by day, and in time he came to be looked up to by them with a sort of wondering awe as a superior being. He seemed to know so much, and he could do and say such marvelous things. And withal, he was so deep and wise. Tom's remarks and Tom's performances were reported by the boys to their elders, and these also presently began to discuss Tom Canty and to regard him as a most gifted and extraordinary creature. Full-grown people brought their perplexities to Tom for solution and were often astonished at the wit and wisdom of his decisions. In fact, he was become a hero to all who knew him except his own family. These only saw nothing in him. Privately, after a while, Tom organized a royal court. He was the prince. His special comrades were guards, chamberlains, equerries, lords and ladies-in-waiting, and the royal family. Daily the mock prince was received with elaborate ceremonials borrowed by Tom from his romantic readings. Daily the great affairs of the mimic kingdom were discussed in the royal council. 
and daily, His Memic Highness issued decrees to his imaginary armies, navies, and viceroyalties, after which he would go forth in his rags and beg a few farthings, eat his poor crust, take his customary cuffs and abuse, and then stretch himself upon his handful of foul straw and resume his empty grandeurs in his dreams. And still his desire to look just once upon a real prince in the flesh grew upon him, day by day and week by week, until at last it absorbed all other desires and became the one passion of his life. One January day, on his usual begging tour, he tramped despondently up and down the region, round about Mincing Lane and Little East Cheap, hour after hour, barefooted and cold, looking in at cookshop windows and longing for the dreadful pork pies and other deadly inventions displayed there. For to him these were dainties fit for the angels, that is, judging by the smell they were, for it had never been his good luck to own and eat one. There was a cold drizzle of rain. The atmosphere was murky. It was a melancholy day. At night Tom reached home so wet and tired and hungry that it was not possible for his father and grandmother to observe his forlorn condition and not be moved, after their fashion. Wherefore they gave him a brisk cuffing at once and sent him to bed. For a long time his pain and hunger and the swearing and fighting going on in the building kept him awake but at last his thoughts drifted away to far romantic lands, and he fell asleep in the company of jeweled and gilded princelings who lived in vast palaces and had servants salaaming before them or flying to execute their orders. And then, as usual, he dreamed that he was a princeling himself. All night long the glories of his royal estate shone upon him, he moved among great lords and ladies in a blaze of light, breathing perfumes, drinking in delicious music, and answering the reverent obeisances of the glittering throng as it parted to make way for him, with here a smile and there a nod of his princely head. And when he awoke in the morning and looked upon the wretchedness about him, his dream had had its usual effect, it had intensified the sordidness of his surroundings a thousandfold. Then came bitterness and heartbreak and tears. Chapter 3 Tom's Meeting with the Prince Tom got up hungry and sauntered hungry away, but with his thoughts busy with the shadowy splendors of his night's dreams. He wandered here and there in the city, hardly noticing where he was going or what was happening around him. People jostled him, and some gave him rough speech, but it was all lost on the musing boy. By and by he found himself at Temple Bar, the farthest from home he had ever traveled in that direction. He stopped and considered a moment, then fell into his imaginings again, and passed on outside the walls of London. The Strand had ceased to be a country road then, and regarded itself as a street, but by a strained construction, for though there was a tolerably compact row of houses on one side of it, there were only some scattering great buildings on the other, these being palaces of rich nobles with ample and beautiful grounds stretching to the river, grounds that are now closely packed with grim acres of brick and stone. Tom discovered Charing Village presently and rested himself at the beautiful cross built there by a bereaved king of earlier days, then idled down a quiet, lovely road past the great cardinal's stately palace, toward a far more mighty and majestic palace beyond, Westminster. Tom stared in glad wonder at the vast pile of masonry, the wide-spreading wings, 
the frowning bastions and turrets, the huge stone gateway with its gilded bars and its magnificent array of colossal granite lions and the other signs and symbols of English royalty. Was the desire of his soul to be satisfied at last? Here indeed was a king's palace. Might he not hope to see a prince now, a prince of flesh and blood, if heaven were willing? At each side of the gilded gate stood a living statue, that is to say, an erect and stately and motionless man-at-arms, clad from head to heel in shining steel armor. At a respectful distance were many country folk and people from the city waiting for any chance glimpse of royalty that might offer. Splendid carriages with splendid people in them and splendid servants outside were arriving and departing by several other noble gateways that pierced the royal enclosure. Poor little Tom in his rags approached and was moving slow and timidly past the sentinels with a beating heart and a rising hope when all at once he caught sight through the golden bars of a spectacle that almost made him shout for joy. Within was a comely boy, tanned and brown with sturdy outdoor sports and exercises, whose clothing was all of lovely silks and satins, shining with jewels. At his hip a little jeweled sword and dagger, dainty buskins on his feet with red heels and on his head a jaunty crimson cap with drooping plumes fastened with a great sparkling gem. Several gorgeous gentlemen stood near, his servants without a doubt. Oh, he was a prince, a prince, a living prince, a real prince without the shadow of a question. And the prayer of the pauper boy's heart was answered at last. Tom's breath came quick and short with excitement, and his eyes grew big with wonder and delight. Everything gave way in his mind instantly to one desire. That was to get close to the prince and have a good devouring look at him. Before he knew what he was about, he had his face against the gate bars. The next instant, one of the soldiers snatched him rudely away, and sent him spinning among the gaping crowd of country gawks and London idlers. The soldier said, Mind thy manners, thou young beggar. The crowd jeered and laughed, but the young prince sprang to the gate with his face flushed and his eyes flashing with indignation, and cried out, How dost thou use a poor lad like that? How dost thou use the king my father's meanest subject so? Open the gates and let him in. You should have seen that fickle crowd snatch off their hats then. You should have heard them cheer and shout, Long live the Prince of Wales! The soldiers presented arms with their halberds, opened the gates and presented again as the little Prince of Poverty passed in, in his fluttering rags, to join hands with the Prince of Limitless Plenty. Edward Tudor said, Thou lookest tired and hungry. Thou hast been treated ill. Come with me. Half a dozen attendants sprang forward to, I don't know what, interfere, no doubt. But they were waved aside with a right royal gesture, and they stopped stock still where they were, like so many statues. Edward took Tom to a rich apartment in the palace, which he called his cabinet. By his command, a repast was brought such as Tom had never encountered before, except in books. The prince, with princely delicacy and breeding, sent away the servants so that his humble guest might not be embarrassed by their critical presence. Then he sat nearby and asked questions while Tom ate. What is thy name, lad? Tom Canty, and it please thee, sir. Tis an odd one. Where dost live? In the city, please thee, sir. Awful court out of Pudding Lane. Awful court? Truly, tis another odd one. Hast parents? 
Parents have I, sir, and a grand dam likewise that is but indifferently precious to me. God forgive me if it be offence to say it, also twin sisters, Nan and Bet. Then is thy grand dam not over kind to thee, I take it? Neither to any other is she, so please your worship. She hath a wicked heart, and worketh evil all her days. Doth she mistreat thee? There be times that she stayeth her hand, being asleep or overcome with drink, but when she hath her judgment clear again, she maketh it up to me with goodly beatings. A fierce look came into the little prince's eyes, and he cried out, What? Beatings? Oh, indeed, yes, please you, sir. Beatings? And thou so frail and little? Hark ye, before the night come she shall hie her to the tower. The king, my father, in sooth you forget, sir, her low degree. The tower is for the great alone. True, indeed. I had not thought of that. I will consider of her punishment. Is thy father kind to thee? Not more than grandma canty, sir. Fathers be alike, mayhap. Mine hath not a doll's temper. He smiteth with a heavy hand, yet spareth me. He spareth me not always with his tongue, though, sooth to say. How doth thy mother use thee? She is good, sir, and giveth me neither sorrow nor pain of any sort, and Nan and Bet are like to her in this. How old be these? Fifteen, an it please you, sir. The Lady Elizabeth, my sister, is fourteen, and the Lady Jane Grey, my cousin, is of mine own age, and comely and gracious withal. But my sister the Lady Mary, with her gloomy mien and... Look you, do thy sisters forbid their servants to smile, lest the sin destroy their souls? They? How dost think, sir, that they have servants? The little prince contemplated the little pauper gravely a moment, then said, And prithee, why not? Who helpeth them undress at night? Who attireth them when they rise? None, sir. Wouldst have them take off their garment and sleep without, like beasts? Their garment? Have they but one? Ah, good your worship, what would they do with more? Truly they have not two bodies each. It is a quaint and marvellous thought. Uh, thy pardon, I had not meant to laugh. But thy good nan and thy bet shall have raiment and lackeys enow, and that soon, too. My cofferer shall look to it. No, thank me not, tis nothing. Thou speakest well. Thou hast an easy grace in it. Art learned? I know not if I am or not, sir. The good priest that is called Father Andrew taught me of his kindness from his books. Knowest thou the Latin? But scantly, sir, I doubt. Learn it, lad. Tis hard only at first. The Greek is harder, but neither these nor any tongues else, I think, are hard to the Lady Elizabeth and my cousin. Thou shouldst hear those damsels at it. But tell me of thy awful court. Hast thou a pleasant life there? In truth, sir, so please you, sir, save when one is hungry. There be Punch and Judy shows, and monkeys, oh, such antic creatures, and so bravely dressed. And there be plays, wherein they that play do shout and fight till all are slain, and tis so fine to see, and costeth but a farthing, albeit tis main hard to get the farthing, please your worship. Tell me more. We lads of awful court do strive against each other with the cudgel, like to the fashion of the prentices sometimes. The prince's eyes flashed. Said he, Marry, that would not I mislike. Tell me more. We strive in races, sir, to see who of us shall be fleetest. That I would like also. Speak on. In summer, sir, we wade and swim in the canals and in the river, and each doth duck his neighbour and spatter him with water, and dive and shout and tumble, and twould be worth my father's kingdom but to enjoy it once. Prithee, go on. We dance and sing about the maypole in Cheapside. 
We play in the sand, each covering his neighbour up, and times we make mud pastry. Oh, the lovely mud! It hath not its like for delightfulness in all the world. We do fairly wallow in the mud, sir, saving your worship's presence. Oh, prithee, say no more. Tis glorious. If that I could but clothe me in raiment like to thine, and strip my feet, and revel in the mud once, just once, with none to rebuke me or forbid, meseemeth I could forego the crown. And if that I could clothe me once, sweet sir, as thou art clad, just once, oh, oh wouldst like it? Then so shall it be. Doth thy rags, and don these splendours, lad. It is a brief happiness, but will not be less keen for that. We will have it while we may, and change again before any come to molest. A few minutes later, the little Prince of Wales was garlanded with Tom's fluttering odds and ends, and the little Prince of Popperdom was tricked out in the gaudy plumage of royalty. The two went and stood side by side before a great mirror, and lo, a miracle. There did not seem to have been any change made. They stared at each other, then at the glass, then at each other again. At last the puzzled princeling said, What dost thou make of this? Ah, good your worship, require me not to answer. It is not meet that one of my degree should utter the thing. Then will I utter it. Thou hast the same hair, the same eyes, the same voice and manner, the same form and stature, the same face and countenance that I bear. Fared we forth naked, there is none could say which was you and which the Prince of Wales. And now that I am clothed as thou wert clothed, it seemeth I should be able the more nearly to feel as thou didst, when the brute soldier... Hark ye, is not this a bruise upon your hand? Yes, but it is a slight thing, and your worship knoweth that the poor man at arms... Peace? It was a shameful thing and a cruel, cried the little prince, stamping his bare foot. If the king... Stir not a step till I come again. It is a command... In a moment he had snatched up and put away an article of national importance that lay upon a table, and was out at the door and flying through the palace grounds in his bannered rags with a hot face and glowing eyes. As soon as he reached the great gate he seized the bars and tried to shake them, shouting, Open! Unbar the gates! The soldier that had maltreated Tom obeyed promptly, and as the prince burst through the portal, half smothered with royal wrath, the soldier fetched him a sounding box on the ear that sent him whirling to the roadway, and said, Take that, thou beggar's spawn, for what thou gotst me from his highness. The crowd roared with laughter. The prince picked himself out of the mud and made fiercely at the sentry, shouting, I am the prince of Wales. My person is sacred and thou shalt hang for laying thy hand upon me. The soldier brought his halberd to a present arms, and said mockingly, I salute your gracious highness, then angrily, Be off, thou crazy rubbish. Here the jeering crowd closed around the poor little prince, and hustled him far down the road, hooting him and shouting, Way for his royal highness, way for the prince of Wales. Chapter 4 The Prince's Troubles Begin After hours of persistent pursuit and persecution, the little prince was at last deserted by the rabble and left to himself. As long as he had been able to rage against the mob and threaten it royally, and royally utter commands that were good stuff to laugh at, he was very entertaining, but when weariness finally forced him to be silent, he was no longer of use to his tormentors, and they sought amusement elsewhere. He looked about him now, but could not recognize the locality. He was within the city of London. That was all he knew. 
He moved on aimlessly, and in a little while the houses thinned and the passers-by were infrequent. He bathed his bleeding feet in the brook which flowed then, where Farrington Street now is, rested a few moments, then passed on, and presently came upon a great space with only a few scattered houses in it and a prodigious church. He recognized this church. Scaffoldings were about everywhere and swarms of workmen, for it was undergoing elaborate repairs. The prince took heart at once. He felt that his troubles were at an end now. He said to himself, It is the ancient Grey Friars Church, which the king my father hath taken from the monks and given for a home forever for poor and forsaken children and new named it Christ's Church. Right gladly will they serve the son of him who hath done so generously by them, and the more that that son is himself as poor and as forlorn as any that be sheltered here this day, or ever shall be. He was soon in the midst of a crowd of boys who were running, jumping, playing at ball and leapfrog, and otherwise disporting themselves, and right noisily, too. They were all dressed alike, and in the fashion which in that day prevailed among serving men and prentices. That is to say, each had on the crown of his head a flat black cap about the size of a saucer, which was not useful as a covering, it being of such scanty dimensions, neither was it ornamental. From beneath it the hair fell unparted to the middle of the forehead and was cropped straight around, a clerical band at the neck, a blue gown that fitted closely and hung as low as the knees or lower, full sleeves, a broad red belt, bright yellow stockings gartered above the knees, low shoes with large metal buckles. It was a sufficiently ugly costume. Note 1. Christ's Hospital Costume it is most reasonable to regard the dress as copied from the costume of the citizens of London of that period, when long blue coats were the common habit of apprentices and serving men, and yellow stockings were generally worn. The coat fits closely to the body but has loose sleeves, and beneath is worn a sleeveless yellow undercoat. Around the waist is a red leathern girdle, a clerical band around the neck, and a small flat black cap about the size of a saucer completes the costume. Tim's Curiosities of London The boys stopped their play and flocked about the prince, who said with native dignity, Good lads, say to your master that Edward, Prince of Wales, desireth speech with him. A great shout went up at this, and one rude fellow said, Mary, art thou his grace's messenger, beggar? The prince's face flushed with anger, and his ready hand flew to his hip, but there was nothing there. There was a storm of laughter, and one boy said, Didst mark that? He fancied he had a sword. Belike he is the prince himself. This sally brought more laughter. Poor Edward drew himself up proudly and said, I am the prince, and it ill beseemeth you that feed upon the king my father's bounty to use me so. This was vastly enjoyed, as the laughter testified. The youth who had first spoken shouted to his comrades, Ho, swine, slaves, pensioners of his grace's princely father, where be your manners? Down on your marrow-bones, all of you, and do reverence to his kingly port and royal rags. With boisterous mirth, they dropped upon their knees in a body and did mock homage to their prey. The prince spurned the nearest boy with his foot and said fiercely, Take thou that till the morrow come, and I build thee a gibbet. Ah, but this was not a joke. This was going beyond fun. The laughter seized on the instant, and fury took its place. A dozen shouted, Hail him forth! To the horse-pond! To the horse-pond! 
Where be the dogs? Ho there, lion! Ho, fangs! Then followed such a thing as England had never seen before, the sacred person of the heir to the throne, rudely buffeted by plebeian hands, and set upon and torn by dogs. As night drew to a close that day, the prince found himself far down in the close-built portion of the city. His body was bruised, his hands were bleeding, and his rags were all besmirched with mud. He wandered on and on, and grew more and more bewildered, and so tired and faint he could hardly drag one foot after the other. He had ceased to ask questions of anyone, since they brought him only insult instead of information. He kept muttering to himself, Awful Court, that is the name, if I can but find it before my strength is wholly spent, and I drop, then am I saved, for his people will take me to the palace, and prove that I am none of theirs, but the true prince, and I shall have mine own again. And now and then his mind reverted to his treatment by those rude Christ's hospital boys, and he said, When I am king, they shall not have bread and shelter only, but also teachings out of books, for a full belly is little worth where the mind is starved and the heart. I will keep this diligently in my remembrance, that this day's lesson be not lost upon me, and my people suffer thereby, for learning softeneth the heart and breedeth gentleness and charity. Note 2 it appears that Christ's hospital was not originally founded as a school. Its object was to rescue children from the streets, to shelter, feed, clothe them, etc. Tim's Curiosities of London The lights began to twinkle. It came on to rain. The wind rose, and a raw, gusty night set in. The houseless prince the homeless heir to the throne of England still moved on, drifting deeper into the maze of squalid alleys where the swarming hives of poverty and misery were massed together. Suddenly a great drunken ruffian collared him and said, Out to this time of night again, and hast not brought a farthing home, I warrant me. If it be so, and I do not break all the bones in thy lean body, then I am not John Canty, but some other. The prince twisted himself loose, unconsciously brushed his profaned shoulder, and eagerly said, Oh, art his father truly? Sweet heaven, grant it be so. Then wilt thou fetch him away, and restore me. His father? I know not what thou meanst. Ah, but know I am thy father, as thou shalt soon have cause to. Oh, jest not, palter not, delay not. I am worn, I am wounded, I can bear no more. Take me to the king, my father, and he will make thee rich beyond thy wildest dreams. Believe me, man, believe me. I speak no lie, but only the truth. Put forth thy hand and save me. I am indeed the Prince of Wales. The man stared down, stupefied, upon the lad, then shook his head and muttered, Gone stark mad as any Tom of Bedlam, then collared him once more, and said with a coarse laugh and an oath, But mad or no mad, I and thy grandma Canty will soon find where the soft places in thy bones lie, or I'm no true man. With this he dragged the frantic and struggling prince away, and disappeared up a front court, followed by a delighted and noisy swarm of human vermin. Chapter 5 Tom as a Patrician Tom Canty, left alone in the prince's cabinet, made good use of his opportunity. He turned himself this way and that before the great mirror, admiring his finery, then walked away, imitating the prince's high-bred carriage, and still observing results in the glass. 
Next he drew the beautiful sword and bowed, kissing the blade and laying it across his breast, as he had seen a noble knight do by way of salute to the lieutenant of the tower five or six weeks before, when delivering the great lords of Norfolk and Surrey into his hands for captivity. Tom played with the jeweled dagger that hung upon his thigh. He examined the costly and exquisite ornaments of the room. He tried each of the sumptuous chairs and thought how proud he would be if the awful court heard could only peep in and see him in his grandeur. He wondered if they would believe the marvelous tale he should tell when he got home, or if they would shake their heads and say his overtaxed imagination had at last upset his reason. At the end of half an hour, it suddenly occurred to him that the prince was gone a long time. Then right away he began to feel lonely. Very soon he fell to listening and longing, and ceased to toy with the pretty things about him. He grew uneasy, then restless, then distressed. Suppose someone should come and catch him in the prince's clothes, and the prince not there to explain. Might they not hang him at once and inquire into his case afterward? He had heard that the great were prompt about small matters. His fears rose higher and higher, and trembling, he softly opened the door to the antechamber, resolved to fly and seek the prince, and through him protection and release. Six gorgeous gentlemen servants and two young pages of high degree, clothed like butterflies, sprung to their feet and bowed low before him. He stepped quickly back and shut the door. He said, Oh, they mock at me. They will go and tell. Oh, why came I here to cast away my life? He walked up and down the floor, filled with nameless fears, listening, starting at every trifling sound. Presently the door swung open, and a silken page said, The Lady Jane Grey. The door closed, and a sweet young girl, richly clad, bounded toward him. But she stopped suddenly and said in a distressed voice, Oh, what aileth thee, my lord? Tom's breath was nearly failing him, but he made shift to stammer out, Ah, be merciful thou, in sooth I am no lord, but only poor Tom Canty of awful court in the city. Prithee, let me see the prince, and he will of his grace restore to me my rags, and let me hence unhurt. Oh, be thou merciful, and save me. By this time the boy was on his knees, and supplicating with his eyes and uplifted hands, as well as with his tongue. The young girl seemed horror-stricken. She cried out, Oh, my Lord, on thy knees, and to me. Then she fled away in fright, and Tom, smitten with despair, sank down, murmuring, There is no help. There is no hope. Now they will come and take me. Whilst he lay there, benumbed with terror, dreadful tidings were speeding through the palace. The whisper, for it was whispered almost, flew from menial to menial, from lord to lady, down all the long corridors, from story to story, from saloon to saloon. The prince hath gone mad. The prince hath gone mad. Soon every saloon, every marble hall, had its group of glittering lords and ladies and other groups of dazzling lesser folk, talking earnestly in whispers, and every face had in it dismay. Presently a splendid official came marching by these groups, making solemn proclamation, In the name of the king, let none list to this false and foolish matter upon pain of death, nor discuss the same, nor carry it abroad, in the name of the king. The whisperings ceased, as suddenly as if the whisperers had been stricken dumb. Soon there was a general buzz along the corridors of, The prince! See, the prince comes! Poor Tom came slowly walking past the low-bowing groups, trying to bow in return, 
and meekly gazing upon his strange surroundings with bewildered and pathetic eyes. Great nobles walked upon each side of him, making him lean upon them, and so steady his steps. Behind him followed the court physicians and some servants. Presently Tom found himself in a noble apartment of the palace, and heard the door close behind him. Around him stood those who had come with him. Before him, at a little distance, reclined a very large and very fat man, with a wide, pulpy face and a stern expression. His large head was very gray, and his whiskers, which he wore only around his face like a frame, were gray also. His clothing was of rich stuff, but old and slightly frayed in places. One of his swollen legs had a pillow under it and was wrapped in bandages. There was silence now, and there was no head there but was bent in reverence, except this man's. This stern-countenanced invalid was the dread Henry the Eighth. He said, and his face grew gentle as he began to speak, How now, my lord Edward, my prince, hast been minded to cousin me, the good king thy father, who loveth thee and kindly useth thee with a sorry jest? Poor Tom was listening, as well as his dazed faculties would let him, to the beginning of this speech, but when the words, Me, the good king, fell upon his ear, his face blanched, and he dropped as instantly upon his knees as if a shot had brought him there. Lifting up his hands, he exclaimed, Thou the king? Then am I undone indeed. This speech seemed to stun the king. His eyes wandered from face to face aimlessly, then rested bewildered upon the boy before him. Then he said in a tone of deep disappointment, Alack, I had believed the rumor disproportioned to the truth, but I fear me it is not so. He breathed a heavy sigh and said in a gentle voice, Come to thy father, child, thou art not well. Tom was assisted to his feet, and approached the majesty of England, humble and trembling. The king took the frightened face between his hands, and gazed earnestly and lovingly into it a while, as if seeking some grateful sign of returning reason there, then pressed the curly head against his breast, and patted it tenderly. Presently he said, Dost not know thy father, child? Break not mine old heart. Say thou knowest me. Thou dost know me, dost thou not? Yea, thou art my dread lord the king, whom God preserve. True, true, that is well. Be comforted. Tremble not so. There is none here would hurt thee. There is none here but loves thee. Thou art better now. Thy ill dream passeth, is't not so? And thou knowest thyself now also, is't not so? Thou wilt not miscall thyself again, as they say thou didst a little while agone. I pray thee of thy grace, believe me, I did but speak the truth, most dread lord, for I am the meanest among thy subjects, being a pauper born, and tis by a sore mischance and accident I am here, albeit I was therein nothing blameful. I am but young to die, and thou canst save me with one little word, O oh, speak it, sir. Die? Talk not so, sweet prince. Peace. Peace to thy troubled heart, thou shalt not die. Tom dropped upon his knees with a glad cry, God requite thy mercy, O my king, and save thee long to bless thy land. Then springing up, he turned a joyful face toward the two lords in waiting, and exclaimed, Thou heardst it, I am not to die, the king hath said it. There was no movement, 
save that all bowed with grave respect, but no one spoke. He hesitated, a little confused, then turned timidly toward the king, saying, I may go now? Go? Surely, if thou desirest. But why not tarry yet a little? Whither wouldst go? Tom dropped his eyes and answered humbly, Peradventure I mistook, but I did think me free, and so was I moved to seek again the kennel where I was born and bred to misery, yet which harboureth my mother and my sisters, and so is home to me, whereas these pomps and splendours whereunto I am not used. Oh, please you, sir, to let me go. The king was silent and thoughtful a while, and his face betrayed a growing distress and uneasiness. Presently he said with something of hope in his voice, Perchance he is but mad upon this one strain, and hath his wits unmarred as toucheth other matter. God send it may be so, we will make trial. Then he asked Tom a question in Latin, and Tom answered him lamely in the same tongue. The king was delighted and showed it. The lords and doctors manifested their gratification also. The king said, "'Twas not according to his schooling and ability, but showeth that his mind is but diseased, not stricken fatally. How say you, sir?' The physician addressed, bowed low, and replied, "'It jumpeth with mine own conviction, sire, that thou hast divined aright. The king looked pleased with this encouragement, coming as it did from so excellent authority, and continued with good heart. Now mark ye all, we will try him further. He put a question to Tom in French. Tom stood silent a moment, embarrassed by having so many eyes centered upon him, then said diffidently, I have no knowledge of this tongue, so please your majesty. The king fell back upon his couch. The attendants flew to his assistance, but he put them aside and said, Trouble me not, it is nothing but a scurvy faintness. Raise me, there tis sufficient. Come hither, child, there rest thy poor troubled head upon thy father's heart and be at peace. Thou'lt soon be well, tis but a passing fantasy. Fear thou not, thou'lt soon be well. Then he turned toward the company. His gentle manner changed, and baleful lightnings began to play from his eyes. He said, List ye all, this my son is mad, but it is not permanent. Overstudy hath done this, and somewhat too much of confinement. Away with his books and teachers, see to it. Pleasure him with sports, beguile him in wholesome ways, so that his health come again. He raised himself higher still, and went on with energy. He is mad, but he is my son, and England's heir and mad or sane, still shall he reign. And hear ye further, and proclaim it. Whoso speaketh of this his distemper, worketh against the peace and order of these realms, and shall to the gallows. Give me to drink. I burn. This sorrow sappeth my strength. There, take away the cup. Support me. There, that is well. Mad is he? Were he a thousand times mad, yet is he Prince of Wales, and I, the King, will confirm it. This very morrow shall he be installed in his princely dignity in due and ancient form. Take instant order for it, my Lord Harford. One of the nobles knelt at the royal couch and said, the king's majesty knoweth that the hereditary great marshal of England lieth attainted in the tower. It were not meet that one attainted. Peace! Insult not mine ears with his hated name. 
Is this man to live forever? Am I to be balked of my will? Is the prince to tarry uninstalled, because forsooth the realm lacketh an earl marshal free of treasonable taint to invest him with his honours? No, by the splendour of God. Warn my parliament to bring me Norfolk's doom before the sun rise again, else shall they answer for it grievously. Note 3. The Duke of Norfolk's Condemnation Commanded the king was now approaching fast towards his end, and fearing lest Norfolk should escape him, he sent a message to the commons by which he desired them to hasten the bill, on pretense that Norfolk enjoyed the dignity of Earl Marshal, and it was necessary to appoint another who might officiate at the ensuing ceremony of installing his son, Prince of Wales. Hume, Volume 3 Page 307. Lord Harford said, The king's will is law, and rising returned to his former place. Gradually the wrath faded out of the old king's face, and he said, Kiss me, my prince. There, what fearest thou? Am I not thy loving father? Thou art good to me that am unworthy, O mighty and gracious lord. That in truth I know, but, but it grieveth me to think of him that is to die, and, ah, tis like thee, tis like thee, I know thy heart is still the same, even though thy mind hath suffered hurt, for thou wert ever of a gentle spirit. But this duke standeth between thee and thine honours, I will have another in his stead that shall bring no taint to his great office. Comfort thee, my prince, trouble not thy poor head with this matter. But is it not I that speed him hence, my liege? How long might he not live but for me? Take no thought of him, my prince, he is not worthy. Kiss me once again, and go to thy trifles and amusements, for my malady distresseth me. I am a-weary and would rest. Go with thine uncle Harford and thy people, and come again when my body is refreshed. Tom, heavy-hearted, was conducted from the presence, for this last sentence was a death-blow to the hope he had cherished that now he would be set free. Once more he heard the buzz of low voices exclaiming, The prince, the prince comes. His spirits sank lower and lower as he moved between the glittering files of bowing courtiers, for he recognized that he was indeed a captive now, and might remain forever shut up in this gilded cage, a forlorn and friendless prince, except God in his mercy take pity on him and set him free. And turn where he would, he seemed to see floating in the air, the severed head and the remembered face of the great Duke of Norfolk, the eyes fixed on him reproachfully. His old dreams had been so pleasant, but this reality was so dreary. Chapter 6 Tom Receives Instructions Tom was conducted to the principal apartment of a noble suite, and made to sit down, a thing which he was loath to do, since there were elderly men and men of high degree about him. He begged them to be seated also, but they only bowed their thanks or murmured them, and remained standing. He would have insisted, but his uncle, the Earl of Harford, whispered in his ear, Prithee, insist not, my lord, it is not meet that they sit in thy presence. The Lord St. John was announced, and after making obeisance to Tom, he said, I come upon the king's errand concerning a matter which requireth privacy. Will it please your royal highness to dismiss all that attend you here, save my lord the Earl of Harford? Observing that Tom did not seem to know how to proceed, Harford whispered to him to make a sign with his hand, 
and not trouble himself to speak unless he chose. When the waiting gentleman had retired, Lord St. John said, His Majesty commandeth that for due and weighty reasons of state, the Prince's grace shall hide his infirmity in all ways that be within his power, till it be past, and he be as he was before, to wit that he shall deny to none that he is the true Prince and heir to England's greatness, that he shall uphold his princely dignity, and shall receive without word or sign of protest that reverence and observance which unto it do appertain of right and ancient usage, that he shall cease to speak to any of that lowly birth and life his malady hath conjured out of the unwholesome imaginings of overwrought fancy, that he shall strive with diligence to bring unto his memory again those faces which he was wont to know, and where he faileth he shall hold his peace, neither betraying by semblance or surprise or other sign that he hath forgot, that upon occasions of state, whensoever any matter shall perplex him as to the thing he should do or the utterance he should make, he shall show naught of unrest to the curious that look on, but take advice in that matter of the Lord Harford or my humble self, which are commanded of the king to be upon this service, and close at call till this commandment be dissolved. Thus saith the king's majesty, who sendeth greeting to your royal highness, and prayeth that God will of his mercy quickly heal you, and have you now and ever in his holy keeping. The Lord St. John made reverence and stood aside. Tom replied resignedly, The king hath said it, None may palter with the king's command, or fit it to his ease, where it doth chafe, with deft evasions. The king shall be obeyed. Lord Harford said, Touching the king's majesty's ordainment concerning books and such like serious matters, it may peradventure please your highness to ease your time with lightsome entertainment, lest you go wearied to the banquet and suffer harm thereby. Tom's face showed inquiring surprise, and a blush followed when he saw Lord St. John's eyes bent sorrowfully upon him. His lordship said, The memory still wrongeth thee, and thou hast shown surprise, but suffer it not to trouble thee, for tis a matter that will not abide but depart with thy mending malady. My lord of Harford speaketh of the city's banquet which the king's majesty did promise some two months flown your highness should attend. Thou recallest it now? It grieves me to confess it had indeed escaped me, said Tom in a hesitating voice, and blushed again. At this moment the Lady Elizabeth and the Lady Jane Grey were announced. The two lords exchanged significant glances, and Harford stepped quickly toward the door. As the young girls passed him, he said in a low voice, I pray ye, ladies, seem not to observe his humors, nor show surprise when his memory doth lapse. It will grieve you to note how it doth stick at every trifle. Meantime, Lord St. John was saying in Tom's ear, Please you, sir, keep diligently in mind his majesty's desire. Remember all thou canst, seem to remember all else. Let them not perceive that thou art much changed from thy want, for thou knowest how tenderly thy old playfellows bear thee in their hearts, and how it would grieve them. Art willing, sir, that I remain, and thine uncle? Tom signified assent with a gesture and a murmured word, for he was already learning, and in his simple heart was resolved to acquit himself as best he might, according to the king's command. In spite of every precaution, the conversation among the young people became a little embarrassing at times. More than once, in truth, Tom was near to breaking down and confessing himself unequal to his tremendous part. 
But the tact of the Princess Elizabeth saved him, or a word from one or the other of the vigilant lords, thrown in apparently by chance, had the same happy effect. Once the little Lady Jane turned to Tom and dismayed him with this question, Hast paid thy duty to the Queen's Majesty today, my lord? Tom hesitated, looked distressed, and was about to stammer out something at hazard, when Lord St. John took the word and answered for him with the easy grace of a courtier accustomed to encounter delicate difficulties and to be ready for them. He hath indeed, madam, and she did greatly hearten him as touching his majesty's condition. Is it not so, your highness? Tom mumbled something that stood for assent, but felt that he was getting upon dangerous ground. Somewhat later it was mentioned that Tom was to study no more at present, whereupon her little ladyship exclaimed, "'Tis a pity, tis such a pity. Thou wert proceeding bravely, but bide thy time in patience. It will not be for long. Thou'lt yet be graced with learning like thy father, and make thy tongue master of as many languages as his, good my prince. My father, cried Tom, off his guard for the moment, I trow he cannot speak his own so that any but the swine that wallow in the stars may tell his meaning, and as for learning of any sort soever, he looked up and encountered a solemn warning in my lord St. John's eyes. He stopped, blushed, then continued low and sadly, Ah, my malady persecuteth me again, and my mind wandereth. I meant the king's grace no irreverence. We know it, sir, said the Princess Elizabeth, taking her brother's hand between her two palms, respectfully but caressingly. Trouble not thyself as to that. The fault is none of thine, but thy distempers. Thou art a gentle comforter, sweet lady, said Tom gratefully, and my heart moveth me to thank thee for it, and I may be so bold. Once the giddy little lady Jane fired a simple Greek phrase at Tom, the Princess Elizabeth's quick eye saw by the serene blankness of the target's front that the shaft was overshot, so she tranquilly delivered a return volley of sounding Greek on Tom's behalf, and then straightway changed the talk to other matters. Time wore on pleasantly, and likewise smoothly on the whole. Snags and sandbars grew less and less frequent, and Tom grew more and more at his ease seeing that all were so lovingly bent upon helping him and overlooking his mistakes. When it came out that the little ladies were to accompany him to the Lord Mayor's banquet in the evening, his heart gave a bound of relief and delight, for he felt that he should not be friendless now among that multitude of strangers, whereas an hour earlier the idea of their going with him would have been an insupportable terror to him. Tom's guardian angels, the two lords, had had less comfort in the interview than the other parties to it. They felt as if they were piloting a great ship through a dangerous channel. They were on the alert constantly, and found their office no child's play. Wherefore, at last, when the ladies' visit was drawing to a close, and the Lord Guilford Dudley was announced, they not only felt that their charge had been sufficiently taxed for the present, but also that they themselves were not in the best condition to take their ship back and make their anxious voyage all over again, so they respectfully advised Tom to excuse himself, which he was very glad to do, although a slight shade of disappointment might have been observed upon my Lady Jane's face when she heard the splendid stripling denied admittance, there was a pause now, a sort of waiting silence which Tom could not understand. He glanced at Lord Harford, who gave him a sign, but he failed to understand that also. 
The ready Elizabeth came to the rescue with her usual easy grace. She made reverence and said, Have we leave of the prince's grace, my brother, to go? Tom said, Indeed, your ladyships can have whatsoever of me they will for the asking. Yet would I rather give them any other thing that in my poor power lieth than leave to take the light and blessing of their presence hence. Give ye good den, and God be with ye. Then he smiled inwardly at the thought, "'Tis not for naught I have dwelt among princes in my reading, and taught my tongue some slight trick of their broidered and gracious speech withal." When the illustrious maidens were gone, Tom turned wearily to his keepers, and said, May it please your lordships to grant me leave to go into some corner and rest me? Lord Harford said, So please, your highness, it is for you to command, it is for us to obey. That thou shouldst rest is indeed a needful thing, since thou must journey to the city presently. He touched a bell, and a page appeared, who was ordered to desire the presence of Sir William Herbert. This gentleman came straightway and conducted Tom to an inner apartment. Tom's first movement there was to reach for a cup of water, but a silk and velvet servitor seized it, dropped upon one knee, and offered it to him on a golden salver. Next the tired captive sat down and was going to take off his buskins, timidly asking leave with his eye, but another silk and velvet discomforter went down upon his knees and took the office from him. He made two or three further efforts to help himself, but being promptly forestalled each time, he finally gave up with a sigh of resignation and a murmured, Beshrew me, but I marvel they do not require to breathe for me also. Slippered and wrapped in a sumptuous robe, he laid himself down at last to rest, but not to sleep, for his head was too full of thoughts, and the room too full of people. He could not dismiss the former, so they stayed. He did not know enough to dismiss the latter, so they stayed also. To his vast regret, and theirs, Tom's departure had left his two noble guardians alone. They mused a while with much head-shaking and walking the floor. Then Lord St. John said, Plainly, what dost thou think? Plainly, then, this. The king is near his end. My nephew is mad. Mad will mount the throne, and mad remain. God protect England, since she will need it. Verily it promiseth so indeed. But have you no misgivings as to, as to... The speaker hesitated and finally stopped. He evidently felt that he was upon delicate ground. Lord Harford stopped before him, looking into his face with a clear, frank eye, and said, Speak on, there is none to hear but me. Misgivings as to what? I am full loath to word the thing that is in my mind, and thou so near to him in blood, my lord. But craving pardon if I do offend, seemeth it not strange that madness could so change his port and manner? Not but that his port and speech are princely still, but that they differ in one unweighty trifle or another from what is